pleasure to welcome you to the 40th meeting of the Rotary Year, our 4,840th meeting of our club, and this our eighth online meeting in our 99 year history. And for the first time, we've combined our regular uh, Wednesday meeting, luncheon meeting with the evening meeting. Our guest speakers online this evening are Professor John Wilson AM, Head of Cystic Fibrosis Service at the Alfred Health, and Dr. Louise Segan, Physician and Cardiology Trainee at the Alfred Hospital. The topic of discussion tonight will be, let's chat about women in medicine, hard. Both will be formally introduced later in the program by our Chair, Michaela Safachi. For the moment, I'd just like you to welcome with me, John, Louise and Michaela. And also online tonight, we have our new member, inductee, Edan C, formerly a member of the Rotary Club of Gold Coast. Eden has now joined our club, so a special welcome to you and your sponsor, Ian Evans. And I note that you will also have as your club mentor, Sharon Johnson. It's a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to have so many members online tonight. I believe the number is in the order of about 80, which is just terrific. And uh, in terms of member news, I do note that uh, uh, our group captains have reported through uh, their uh, discussions with their members that everyone is well, certainly from a COVID-19 perspective. Uh, I do also know that Colin Honey is having a little rest and recreation in Epworth Hospital, but he tells us that they've only found bulldog colours, no problems, and he hopes to be back at home and on the field this weekend. Uh, just a message uh, to update uh, our uh, directory. Uh, directory editor Mark Lesser uh, would like to uh, have all members check their directory for telephone numbers, addresses, and notify the office as soon as possible, in fact, by this weekend, the 8th of, uh, of May, uh, to confirm that their entry is correct. And also committee chairs who haven't responded uh, about their member lists for next year, please do so as soon as possible. And a new initiative this Friday morning, uh, thanks to the organization of Joe Maverus, uh, who will be hosting our first ever morning coffee chit chat. Uh, so this is a new initiative and members are invited to join myself and captain of groups Phil for a What's Happening Catch Up, our inaugural coffee club. So ready yourself with a cup of coffee or tea, a biscuit or two and a comfortable chair and relax and tell us what's happening in your world. And the Zoom details for that meeting uh, were included in my president's message uh, yesterday and uh, they'll be circulated again uh, by Joe. It's now my great pleasure to hand the meeting over to our chair tonight, Michaela Savacci, who will look uh, to uh, introduce our guest speakers. Over to you, Michaela. Thank you so much, President Kevin, and welcome everybody. Um, I and the team are absolutely thrilled to be able to introduce our two speakers this evening. We have extre an extremely eminent physician uh, in Professor John Wilson. Um, John, as uh, you may know, has been fighting a very strong battle on the front line with COVID as a respiratory physician, as an advisor to government. His particular interest is in cystic fibrosis and his uh, position, uh, of course, is at the Alfred Hospital Centre of Excellence. John has just recently, this week in fact, been appointed as President <clears throat> of the Royal Australian College of Physicians. So, in addition to his work at the Alfred, he's also uh, now taking a national role in leading all of the physicians across Australia. He's the Chair of the College's Education Committee, and that, that's the College of Physicians, and he's also very widely consulted both here and uh, in Australia and overseas um, for matters pertaining to um, the lungs and all things respiratory. So we're really thrilled to have John uh, with us this evening, or should I say, uh, Professor Wilson. Mm -hmm. um, also very pleased tonight to introduce to you, Dr. Louise Segan. Louise is a final year cardiology trainee, one of only two women in Victoria in that role. 
She will commence next year her PhD in cardio electrophysiology. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I don't know quite that what that means, but I'm very, very grateful if Louise would have performed that and I needed it. Louise is passionate about promoting gender diversity in medicine and with a particular focus on cardiology. So we're very keen tonight to explore a couple of themes which are common not only in the medical profession, but in other professions, including the law, in engineering, in architecture, in other professions, where there seems to be a disparity between the number of women who are coming through their training, and I mean undergraduate training, and then uh, presenting in senior positions as physicians, as uh, you know, partners in law firms, as judges on various benches, whatever that final senior expression looks like. So tonight's conversation, which is modeled a little bit on, um, on um, uh, uh, is his name Gleason, the comedian, you know, let's, ha let's chat hard. <laughs> We're going to explore a few themes around access to senior positions in medicine, around systemic issues that may um, need reform. And John's in a very good position to lead that being the chair of the college. Um, hospital settings and what role they may contribute. And along the way, we'll have a bit of a conversation around John and Louise's um, personal experience and bringing them to tonight's table. So let me start with the first question, perhaps I'll throw to you, Louise. Um, what have you, or what would you say, um, given um, you know, your experience, are the barriers, if you like, to, if there are any, to um, profess, uh, pro progressing to where you are in your profession right now? Thanks, Michaela. Yeah, and um, thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. This is um, an amazing event that you guys have put together. Um, and amazing uh, things that Rotary Victoria has achieved. So um, I guess it, when it comes to uh, where is the role of women in medicine, it is evolving. And, it, and as John and I discussed the other day, it's improved a lot if you look at um, what, what was the pattern in the past. Um, I certainly found when I was in medical school, I didn't really feel like I was in a minority. We were quite equally matched, I guess, in terms of representation. And we're seeing that in our statistics, that women are equally represented in medical school. In fact, we've surpassed males in terms of representation. We comprise over 50% of medical school graduates in Australia and New Zealand. But there seems to be some sort of um, deterioration over time as women progress in medical specialty or and surgical specialty roles, that as they progress in more senior positions, that there is a, a under-representation of women over time. And so this did lead me to become quite interested in this area of research and probably somewhat controversially in my um, first and second year of cardiology training, I decided to band together with the only other female trainee in my year and write a controversial article on this topic. And the reason I say it was controversial is probably at the time people weren't maybe yet ready to uh, face the dilemmas that we were raising and the questions that we were raising about why women are dissuaded from entering um, into medical specialties in um, the field and particularly in cardiology. But just to go back to answering your question, um, some of the things that we identified and when I conceptualized it, we thought there are probably uh, self-imposed or intrinsic factors that we put on ourselves, um, both in thinking about how to balance family planning and um, personal priorities with career aspirations. And then I think there's still institutional um, factors or unconscious bias that comes into play when women are um, trying to uh, conceive different uh, career pathways. Um, and that's partly driven by problems with lack of mentorship, as well as some inflexibilities in existing programs. Thank you very much, Louise. I'm not quite sure who hasn't mute. There we go. Thanks for that. Now, John, you've been a doctor for over 40 years and are now in a very senior position and particularly a good one to see the veranda view, if you like, across Australia, of, of uh, well, Australasia actually, of um, the number of women uh, in medicine. What's been your experience, John, of, of, of uh, barriers that you might have observed? Okay, thanks very much, Michaela. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Rotary Melbourne, for the invitation to meet with you tonight. Um, the question is around barriers and, uh, and Michaela, to be absolutely honest with you, I believe that the situation is evolving very rapidly, far more quickly than we've seen in decades gone by. 
there are a couple of home truths. And if this is uh, a hard quiz, then we've got to face up to the truth. And the sooner we do that, the sooner we get over the barriers and the sooner we move forward. Let me just say right at the beginning, what you see here is not my choice. I did not choose to be born male. I did not choose to be born in the decade I was born in. And a number of other changes that have occurred in my life have not been my choice. However, what limited capacity I have to make a choice, I must do to make sure that others can take advantage of the opportunities they have. Let me be really clear about that. When we look around us, we see a wide diversity in this community. We see men, we see women, we see old, we see young. We see people born here, people who have come here. It's a wide diversity. We are all Australians. It doesn't matter what the beginning was. Let's take that as our position. Some folks might say, well, that's a very socialist view. Others might say, well, look, it's actually realistic. It's the truth. My point of view at this particular time of my life is that I do have something I can do about it, and I will. And that is that we must create a situation where all people who come to training in medical specialties have an opportunity to achieve their full potential. Australia actually has a fabulous record in medical health. If you look at World Bank or WHO figures, we rate number nine out of 200 countries. Ahead of us are countries like Singapore, Monaco, and some very small uh, compared to where we are. But the truth is, the health system here is very good. What we're looking to do is to create a socially defensible situation where all women have the same opportunity as men. Having said that, there are some barriers. And to address the question that you raise, those barriers are, in fact, quite obvious. And people don't talk about them. Let me give you one example. Supreme Court judges are often, more often overruled by men than women. Interruption of court proceedings occur more often by men than women. Decisions that are made in favour of male appointments are done more so by men than women. Does discrimination exist? Yes, it does. Let's put that on the table. So from here, where do we go? Uh, that may be one of your next questions, and I might leave that as my question to you to explore. Thank you, John. So, Louise, in terms of the uh, material that, that um, John has just so eloquently covered, what do you see the opportunities are for systemic reform? Look, that's, uh, there's a lot of um, debate around that at the moment. I think there's, as John sort of mentioned, there's things that we can all do individually. And I think there are things that our college and um, society and institutions can do to support not just gender diversity, but general diversity in um, a variety of industries, not just in medicine. Um, I know that uh, some of the more recent reforms that the college, our College of Physicians has introduced is the Gender Equity uh, Working Group, which is a fantastic initiative just come about in the last few months, comprising male and female fellows to look at ways in which we can uh, promote gender diversity in medicine. So that's a really fantastic initiative. I do think one of the most common themes that seems to be a barrier, not just for women, but for males as well, who are um, trying to balance career with family planning and other personal um, ambitions is around flexible training. And probably what a lot of people outside of medicine or certainly outside of clinical medicine don't realise is that um, training pathways are quite um, taxing and um, quite uh, involved and they do uh, pose a, um, somewhat of a challenge in terms of people planning their personal lives around their career ambitions. Given it's so highly competitive, it is very difficult. 
to negotiate these and I can speak from personal experience that I've put off my own family planning because of lack of flexibility around training pathways. So I do think this is probably one of the biggest areas that we can um, provide some reform, not just for females, but males as well. I'm um, keeping in mind that males who uh, want to take off uh, parental leave get only two weeks after a child's born. So that's a really short amount of time, particularly if you decide to take on a primary care position. So I think that uh, looking at how we can make training pathways more adaptable to contemporary needs of our trainees is a really important area. And I think that some um, specialties are made tackling some ground in this area, particularly the College of Obstetrics have um, created some change in this area, as well as the College of Surgeons, where they've adapted more flexible training models. And even in um, some institutional-based reform, um, one example is St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne have created um, shared care, uh, sorry, um, part-time training options. So interns can share a, one position and do half of that role each so that they can also plan for family and other commitments outside of work. So my feeling is that one of the biggest pillars that we need to tackle is flexible training. So John, what, um, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to speak on behalf of other colleges, but for the College of Physicians, how does that express itself, that, that need to ensure a standard of, of training and care uh, against the need for there to be flexibility and other um, stretch opportunities, if you will? What, what's, what can the college do as a, as a, as a collegiate group sure. to help Thank that? You. So... I think we've taken the lead here and we've adopted as flexible a training program as we can accommodate. The difficulty we have is that there comes a point where one has to uh, really look at the uh, adequacy of training once it's been interrupted multiple times. Now, let's just address that head on. And, and this is where all about hard quiz. Let's go there. So for example, I might start my first year of cardiology training and hypothetically, I find myself pregnant. And I decide that uh, I'm gonna interrupt my training at the appropriate time and take maternity leave, which I'm entitled to do under our EBA, which by the way is expanding rapidly and in its next iteration is gonna be even bigger for maternity leave. So that's all fine. You might say, that's great. Um, we've had, uh, we started our family and that's really good. However, I then get into my next rotation in a different unit, maybe a different hospital, and I find myself pregnant again. And this is fabulous because a great celebration for our family that's expanding. However, what is that going to do for my training opportunities in the next hospital? And so it goes on. So how many pregnancies can we actually fit into a training program? Is there a limit? How far can I go by extending my training year after year after year after year? And is there a rational endpoint where the training committee says, nah, look, I don't know, maybe you're not cut out for this sort of stuff. And in fact, that has occurred. Personally, I don't believe that's appropriate. I don't see any reason why people who uh, wish to have a family and uh, wish to take advantage of flexible training arrangements can't do so. And particularly once you've got to the point of being an expert in cardiology like Louise is, I would believe that uh, uh, there should be the opportunity to uh, expand and continue that. Let me give you, uh, extend that to any consultant physician anywhere in the country and say, we're always learning. All of us are taking on information and expanding, extending our careers. So why are we penalizing people at this end, at the time of their life, when they need to have families and they need to establish relationships, get mortgages, buy properties and establish their professional career? I see no reason to do that. So I support Louise in her position. I don't think there should be any discrimination. I also make the point that the medical colleges don't appoint the trainees. 
the medical colleges recognise the training situation and accredit that. The hospitals themselves are the ones who make the appointments and uh, 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 place the conditions on uh, continuing in the job. So how does the college, our college, have any influence on hospitals? Yes, we do. If you don't abide by the training conditions, we won't register you and we'll not accreditate you, accredit you for future trainees. This sounds a little bit technical, but every so often, colleges have to come down on training institutions and say, ah, 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 can't do that. And you have to be uh, 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 within the boundaries as far as flexible training goes. My door is always open as Louise knows, and I have taken up the opportunity to have a direct discussion with CEOs where that, uh, where that situation arises. And usually they do work out, yes, we do need to show that flexibility. Um, I, can't, I can't say with my hand on my heart, it's happened in every circumstance, but where it's come to our attention, we certainly will act. That's a really good um, segue into the whole hospital um, discussion because we know that registrar training is conducted in public hospitals um, across Australia and that those facilities can vary enormously, not only in terms of patient load, in terms of the profile of the patient, the age of the infrastructure in the facility, the culture that operates in that facility, the research platforms that are available. They're very diverse, as you've just described, John. I might throw to you, Louise, to say, given that you've been in, and I'm no doubt rotated to a number of hospitals, what's your view about how that facility can impact on the registrar's experience and access to consistently good training? No, 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 no. Yeah, that's oh, a good question. And I think house. that's probably one that's um, not gender specific, which is good. Um, I mean, as you point out, I have worked in a few different hospitals, both in a, um, uh, as a medical student and subsequently after graduation, I can say I had some very positive experiences. So I made a decision to do cardiology training when I was a third year um, medical student. So that's quite early generally. Um, and that was on the basis of a, a tutorial by a really fantastic cardiologist who I still have a good mentoring relationship with now who's helped provide a lot of support over time. And he's actually male, but a very good um, champion of women. Um, I think that the people that we're surrounded by in a professional capacity do to a large extent frame both our experience of the culture in an institution, the environment, and um, do have a significant influence on you know, what pathway people decide to take. So I think if you've had a, an experience where you've worked with someone where it's quite stressful, or you found them very intimidating, you might feel less inclined to then go down that pathway. And I think there are even cardiology specifically, I won't name any specifics, but there are probably some subspecialty areas where there is a slightly higher intimidation factor. And some of that's gender specific and some of it isn't. So I think that um, those experiences as a trainee really inform and shape the progression that you have both through the hospital system and in your career. Um, I think that in a research capacity, there's a lot of opportunity to build networks and relationships with people. Um, I did find that personally, I had to um, forge those networks myself. So I went out and um, researched people and emailed them and just was opportunistic. And I was very grateful that um, people were very willing to work with me. And even still, like now I sometimes reach out to people on Twitter, which is a new platform I'm utilising to reach out to people that were previously a bit inaccessible. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for people to uh, forge their own path, whether you're male, female or otherwise, and um, just to uh, look at different career opportunities. So, it, And that doesn't just apply to medicine, outside medicine as well. There's a huge world out there, both in the um, online platform and in real life. And that's a really good point. I mean, so often opportunities that present with in, in any setting really are about access to decision makers and people who will 
um, guide you and shape you and mentor you. Mentoring is, you know, the word that's now used for, for something that I think has been long described as patronage, someone who actually looks after you and takes an interest in your career. John, um, uh, before we go to questions, can I just ask you, um, what, how, how, how important do you think it is, is it for young um, aspiring uh, registrars or, or tra you know, trainees or pre before they even get into the training program to have access to good networks? What's your view about that? Oh, look, um, Michaela, that's absolutely true. Um, I, I guess that, um, as Louise pointed out earlier, that uh, finding a mentor or a role model um, to support you means an enormous amount in, uh, in medical training. For people who actually drift a little from one area to another and don't actually find anything that interests them or a role model or a direction, uh, life can be a little bit lonely. And it can often mean that one takes up positions by default, which is in a way sad. Um, uh, the uh, one school of thought would be that that's natural selection. Um, that, that nobody says to you in medical school, you need to find a mentor and you need to find direction and you better do it now because if you don't, you're going to end up with a career on the rocks. And uh, that doesn't actually happen. So we don't actually have a dedicated lecture that says how to actually form your career. I'm going to give you some advice and I'm going to start now. Uh, and maybe we should. Yeah. And maybe that we should have as part of early education in the professions, uh, uh, some better concept of uh, the ethics and respect and identifying who we are ourselves, capacity to self-reflect and then say, look, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and just as a short example, I've got to say, <laughs> When I was doing medical training back in my uh, early days, I started off uh, doing immunology, then I moved to cancer, and then I moved to gastroenterology, then I moved to intensive care, and then I ended up, one could say, ended up in respiratory medicine. So it's a little bit of a journey, and then it takes a little bit of exploring, a little bit like life, just what your uh, suitabilities really are. But uh, finding a mentor and getting support to do that is really very important. My advice to um, uh, women in medicine who uh, I have supported over years is that uh, we, we look at it together and we look at careers of other people and just see how they've developed and what they've done. And whereabouts do you want to be in your life? Where do you want to go to? Uh, ask, I'm asking you now, and that's often a common question that's asked at interview, where do you want to be in five years' time? And, and uh, most uh, people, I guess, who are on this call would have heard that before. But it's something that um, often trainees in medicine, law, architecture, accounting, don't think about, where do I want to be in five years? I need an income. That's what they're thinking. Yeah. I need to get my ticket. That's what they're thinking. But what is the plan for the career path and are we giving enough guidance? So to go back to your first question to me, how do we overcome the barriers? I believe that we need to be giving good career guidance to people, particularly to women, and identifying what are the barriers, where are the rocks, and how do we get around them? Terrific. Well said. Now, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. And the format that we've been using in this, uh, in this COVID environment is for people to put their questions in the chat, in the chat line. So, um, Reg, I might just quickly ask if I'm on, if I'm on solid ground here, do I, do I read out some of these questions that have been sent through? Is that how we do it? Kayla, please do. Uh, that will make my job a lot easier. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, more, more of a comment before we go to a question, but... Um, one of our Rotarians um, uh, comes from Africa. I'm not sure if he's actually dialed in from there or uh, is here, but comments on the fact that, oh, there's my husband walking into the screen, that in Uganda and in African countries, uh, the medical doctors have to be men and all the women are nurses. So thank goodness we're not in Uganda. 
But let me, um, let me put a question to you from Phil Cornish, who says that hospital administration should be very welcoming of long-term consultant development. And he asks the question if there's any additional issues around regional hospitals, regional rotations. Uh, Louise or John, do you have a view about that? Perhaps we'll throw to you, Louise, if you've done a recent uh, regional rotation. I've definitely done my fair share of regional rotations. They've been very enriching experiences. I must admit, um, there's you can't really substitute the sort of experience you get in a regional centre. It really builds a lot of camaraderie and collaborative sort of uh, management. But I don't think that the issue of gender, in my opinion, uh, seemed to be as heavy a feature in that environment just because I think it's the fact that you're in a smaller environment generally and the collegiality is so strong I don't think that the those issues are at the forefront and maybe they are but it's just not heavily emphasized I think that a lot of people who have come from um, tertiary centers like myself certainly um, bring those issues with them and may discuss them and have raised them and I'm sure that they're common themes to what we experience in um, metropolitan uh, areas. So I think that uh, the, there's not much uh, difference probably, but I do think that um, it's something that when we just, you know, in looking at how we tackle the barriers and identifying barriers, it's something that we really need to um, gauge perspectives of people from all sorts of different um, contexts to better understand the experience of trainees and, and what they think can be part of the initiatives to improve um, training experience. So John, what, what has been your experience? I mean, you, you see it from a veranda view, if you like, regional rotations, is there enormous a, a variation in the quality of the training and the quality of the facility? And how do we uh, ensure that students are getting the best uh, exposure when they go to a regional hospital? Look, um, Michaela, it is suboptimal. All I can say to begin with, many people on this call will know outcomes from heart attacks and strokes in country areas are 10 to 15 percent worse than they are in city centres. Access to good care is still incredibly difficult in this day and age. Mm. The training environment in the country is completely different to what it's like in the city. In the city, the bosses grab all the high ground. The less opportunities that occur here are easily available in rural centres who are far more permissive and far more able to provide um, uh, practical and theoretical opportunities for our trainees. No question. The, the, the big problem is that the other half of people's lives happens to be lifestyle and thoughts of the future. Very few trainees go to the country thinking, I'm going to stay here and I love this. <laughs> they go there, they do it, and they say, yeah, that worked out all right. I didn't mind that at all. That was really good. Uh, good wine. Uh, good weekends off. That was good. I came home a few times, and I enjoyed it. But they don't stay. And part of the problem is that, um, that uh, even though medical practitioners, and I'm not sure about others, but I'm guessing is the same, are highly respected by the community, in rural centres, um, it's not enough. That isn't enough to sustain. And, uh, and, and back to the question of diversity and women in the workforce, I, th I agree with Louise. I think the discrimination against women is far less in rural centres who are crying out for capable practitioners to go there. And they embrace women. They're very happy that they've got somebody capable uh, and, and able and willing, wanting to work in their community. So, uh, so yes. But having said that, what I uh, sorry to use my finger to make a point. Whoever, <laughs> right. my you wife will tell me it. later I do it way too much. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, I do not want to see that as an out for women. And I noticed in one of the comments that there are scholarships available for women to do research. Yes, it's true. But I don't want to see women taking second order alternatives because they can't get into cardiology training jobs in the city. I'm sorry, that's just not good enough.
I think they should be seen as high order alternatives, but nonetheless, that's not where women should go for that reason. I wanted to just ask one more question to, to finish off if we might tonight. And, and I think both of you can answer this. What is the role of a good partner? And what happens when both of you are doctors? So Louise, how important is it to have a supporting other in the house, in the household? So I can't overstate the importance of that. Um, in my situation, my husband is uh, non-medical. Um, he works in the not-for-profit space. He does have some ex uh, exposure to the healthcare environment with um, uh, family members and also having worked in a number of colleges himself. Um, but it, I think that it is very difficult um, when you're the, either the partner of the person in medicine um, or having a partner who's not in medicine, it can be difficult negotiating some of the um, or balancing professional um, aspirations um, with your personal commitments. And as my husband will definitely attest to, um, we've definitely had some challenges thrown at us through the training program. So during my cardiology training, I was sent uh, not sent, but I was allocated to spend two years in Geelong. And so we lived apart for two years and that was very challenging on the relationship. And I think that that's probably not well recognised as the toll that um, some of the, the requirements of training can have on um, families. Uh, the other added stress for us was um, financial. So uh, the two years that I spent in Geelong were not subsidised in terms of accommodation. So I had to pay um, uh, rental as well as um, a mortgage and that was really difficult and um, a lot of my time was spent doing um, overtime and on-call commitments so in addition to you know research and other things I was trying to achieve so um, that was really challenging and I think um, uh, all the credit to my husband for sticking by me and not divorcing me during that time. Mm -hmm. um, I have spoken to a number of colleagues who have the other partner who is medical. And I think that that brings with it a different set of challenges, probably more around balancing two um, high pressured or high aspirational careers where there's the um, competing interests of uh, different stages of your career progression. One of my um, mentors, she's a cardiologist and her husband is an orthopedic registrar. And so they've had to negotiate things around uh, timing of having children, and when to prioritise her career versus his career. So I think that there's definitely challenges in that. There's definitely positives of having a partner in medicine in that you know they might um, un better understand some of the requirements that you go through. Um, but I think just as equally, I'm perfectly happy to come home at the end of the day. And um, I try and get away with talking about medicine, but my husband quickly switches me onto other topics. So I think that's really positive for my mental wellbeing. And what about you, John? Uh, I have to declare that I know John's wife and I think she's fabulous, but John, what sort of support do you have from a non-medical well, background, you know, non-medical partner? Well, um, just to help out here, <laughs> there we are. That's Tracy, who um, I can say provides balance in my life. Uh, she's non-medical and just as well. Um, I think I have enough medicine, uh, both in the college and, and at hospital, that I don't need it at home. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a reality check is uh, worthwhile and, uh, and, and she provides that for me. And when I'm just getting out of control, she tells me you're full of it. <laughs> so um, I think that's, that's pretty, uh, pretty fair. Uh, and and I think that, that as far as partners go, I think uh, people in medicine need to realise that um, uh, there are an importance in diversity. And the reason we have partners is so that we can share our lives and our experiences with someone important and that they can provide benefit for us. Absolutely. I'm not sure how I can un... Where am I going? Am I unsharing yet? Yep, no, that's it. You've done I very can't well. For you, John. <laughs> well, I might, um, uh, in the interests of time, I might call, please, on um, the, the most amazing, one of one of two most amazing people on our committee, and that's Austin Burley, to give the vote of thanks, please, Austin. Is he there? If not, Austin, we have to call on Ari, who is also equally fabulous. 
Oh, I'm now unmuted. Is that right, Reg? Yeah, you can go, Austin. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Michaela. It's a privilege, actually, to have been asked to vote, a vote of thanks on the occasion of our club's first Zoom evening meeting. And uh, thanks to our uh, guests tonight, John and Louise, we've had a very enlightening and in informative, wide-ranging interaction, probably more than we expected, and so, so, uh, so interesting including amongst other things, uh, the barriers, potential opportunities, reforms in pathways, and much, much more. So we're most grateful, Louise and John, for your contribution this evening and enlightening us with what you had to say. As a small gift, a pair of Rotary R100 socks, which I'll display here. <laughs> Are they new or used? <laughs> Um, are a, a token of our appreciation of you being with us this evening. And if you've not already received uh, your socks, and I suspect not because I see Michaela is working from home, not from the office, <laughs> uh, they will be on their way to you. Now, I'd, last, I'd like to uh, ask the people attending this evening to raise their hands in applause to show our appreciation for our panelists this evening. Now, Kevin, President Kevin, it's back to you. Thank you, Austin, and thank you for giving our uh, centenary R100 socks a big boost tonight. Um, we'll look forward to uh, uh, John and Louise joining our photo competition. Um, we like to see photos of where you are wearing your socks. Uh, it's been terrific, and uh, I only echo uh, Austin's summary. Thank you, uh, John, thank you, Louise. And thank you, Michaela, for organising a great format for tonight, a real good panel session uh, brought to you for the first time on Zoom. And uh, to our visitors and guests, uh, yes, I see Richard uh, is online from Uganda. That is terrific, Richard. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, uh, it's nice to see uh, uh, so many members taking the time between six and seven to join us. We'll let you go and have your dinner in just a moment. But I do also want to thank Robert Fisher. It was interesting, his statistic of how many uh, of our members are involved in the medical profession. Uh, and that was, uh, that was a nice uh, segue into tonight's uh, topic. Uh, we want to congratulate uh, Eden uh, on her induction to Rotary Melbourne. And uh, we want to remind you that next week we'll be back to our one o'clock, two o'clock slot when our guest speaker will be uh, Dr. Robert Webster, OAM, who is the state president of the RSL Victorian branch. And he'll be speaking on what is a naive young accountant like me doing in a war zone? You'll find, uh, Robert, very interesting. And uh, for those of you who did see the Anzac Day service uh, uh, segment from the hollowed turf of the MCG, you'll know that Robert stood there uh, alone in the centre with a piper. Uh, next year, we hope to be back with the Collingwood and Essendon football game, but that's another matter. So until next week, stay safe, uh, spread kindness. And now I close the meeting with our national anthem.